started. And uh, Jenna, are, are you going to hit record or do I need to do that? It's recording. It's recording. Okay. So my name is Cheryl DePaulo and I am the director of the Ulster Prevention Council in uh, Kingston, New York, a program of family services. And I'm just going to share my screen with you. And we're going to be talking about substance use disorders today. And um, I just wanted to give a little bit of my background. I don't usually give much, but on this particular topic, I will, because it will probably ex explain a little bit about how I address this as we go along. Um, I, uh, my parents were Salvation Army officers, and so um, as I was growing up, they ran what were then called adult rehabilitation centers. They were rehab centers, and um, at certain times, we would go down, take a van down to the Bowery, and uh, go to people who were all men, basically, homeless on the street and ask them if they wanted to come to the Salvation Army and uh, live there and perhaps get sober. And I have to tell you, we would fill up the van and take it back. Actually, what we'd say was not, do you want to get sober? It'd say three hots and a cot, three hots and a cot, which meant you could get, you know, three good meals and a bed. And that was uh, sometimes enough motivation for someone to want to get in the van and maybe and maybe try. And there was not a lot of success in those years. Um, I went on to go to college and started um, studying education before I majored in psychology, and then ended up going back into the Salvation Army rehab system to run their counseling services um, in a couple of locations in, in Brooklyn, New York, and in Manhattan. And um, and following that, following graduate school, um, I started to work in a private uh, rehab where there are people there who were mostly mandated, mostly by their job. They were going to lose their job unless they completed the 28 day rehab. We also had 49 day adolescent program, which is kind of not heard of anymore. And from there, I went into worked in outpatient treatment. And so here were people who not only still had their jobs, they weren't in inpatient, they were in outpatient. And basically back to, into, from there into treating adolescents. So through my career, I went from kind of the last stages of the disorder backing into the earliest stages and did treatment with um, adolescents in uh, Newburgh, New York for a number of years. And, um, and through that, backed all the way into prevention, which is where I am now, which is looking at the, the very beginning of this and how do we prevent that? So I've seen you know, started with um, end stage of the disorder and backed all the way into how do we prevent these from happening. So I've been around for a long time. Um, I started in the field in 1982. Um, don't do the math. Uh, so we're going to talk about substance use disorders today. This is kind of a basic overview. And a lot of this kind of reflects the changes in thinking since I came to the field, which I would call kind of old school. Um, you know, back in the day, old school, how we used to do it. And things have changed uh, tremendously over the uh, 30, 35 years that I've been in this field. Uh, so that's our prevention slide. I work for the Ulster Prevention Council. So one of the reasons that um, I work in, in prevention is because we, what we know now is that uh, substance use disorders are developmental disorders. And I'm going to use the term addiction as well as substance use disorder. We're going to talk later about language and changes in language and why it matters. But they're pretty much used interchangeably. Some people do object to the word addiction and refer to specifically to substance use disorders or substance misuse. Um, the addiction is kind of a medical term for being addicted to a substance. So here's why it really matters. It's a, it starts early. So the more uh, likely someone is to um, develop a substance use disorder really depends on the age that they first start using. So this particular slide reflects marijuana, but you can see that 67% of people who uh, developed 
a marijuana use disorder uh, were in their teen years, 12 to 17 when they started. And then young adults, 18 to 25, another 26%. So it's really very few people who start using after the age of 25 will develop a substance use disorder. So this is why it's so important to address the teen years and also young adult years. And it really kind of frightens me when I see college populations uh, for reasons that we'll look at in, in a minute. But that 12 to 25 year period is where we're seeing most of these uh, substance use disorders develop. So just a little basic, basic brain, uh, brain um, talk here. When we talk about connections in the brain, and this is where addiction happens. So we have these um, neurons in the brain. They're cells that communicate uh, electrically with each other. And you can see here that the new newborn has kind of few connections and basically starts to make all these connections between neurons. These are the neurons communicating with each other uh, chemically and electrically and building, they build paths so that eventually we have uh, you know, this network of paths that works very quickly and helps us to function. And so you can see kind of a month, nine months, two years, and then uh, adults have a lot more connections. But there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, and so one thing that I want to look at is this uh, thing that happens that's called synaptic pruning. So what happens when, when young children are making all these connections when they're starting to talk and walk and function and, and figure the world out, they make a lot of connections that as they get toward the teen years, uh, they no longer need. These connections are not serving them anymore. And so right before this real spurt of adolescence, there's this thing called pruning, where connections that aren't used at all are pruned back in preparation for the spurt of the development that's going to happen in adolescence. Lots and lots of connections made in adolescence. So we prune back connections, and then we get these new connections happening during the teen years. So one of the main connectors that, ref that reflects substance use disorders is uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine. So this is one of those things that transfers between neurons to make those connections. And dopamine is this neurotransmitter that works in the pleasure center of the brain. And it's this feel-good chemical. So it's the same feeling that you have when you eat a good meal or you have a good laugh, you see something funny, uh, you have uh, good sexual feelings, any kind of a really good feeling, dopamine is released. And this is the one that, um, that most drugs kind of hijack and take over the dopamine uh, system. So we can see kind of just real quickly, and I did this in another training, but I'll just kind of um, reflect it again here for a minute. So natural rewards elevate dopamine levels. So for instance, uh, if our basal dopamine level, you know, usually is around 100, that means we're at homeostasis, we feel pretty good, not a lot going on. Um, and then you have a good feel, the dopal, uh, dopamine output might go up to 150 or so, so we feel better. Uh, with sex, you feel even better than having a, a good meal, hopefully. So it's going up higher, about 200 in this sample. Uh, so we're getting more of a rush of dopamine. But what we can see when we look at some chemicals is that, for instance, cocaine boosts that dopamine up to about 350. So quite a different uh, rush of pleasure than uh, with something more natural like playing a sport, exercising, food, and so forth. And if we look at the amphetamine slide, we're looking at crazy amounts of dopamine release, uh, a, a thousand, uh, maybe a little bit above a thousand, and then dropping back very quickly over a little bit of time. So we're getting that rush of dopamine, and this is what becomes addictive. So people become uh, addicted to actually their own brain chemistry not so much to the substance, but to this rush that it's giving them in the brain. And if you have any questions or comments, just please put them in the chat and, and I will look at them uh, as we go forward. Uh, but I think it's really important to understand this uh, piece about neurotransmitters. Now, dopamine is only one. There's serotonin, uh, 
uh, the uh, marijuana cannabis has its own set of receptors called endocannabinoids. So there are other ones for other substances, but dopamine is, is really the major uh, neurotransmitter. So factors leading to addiction or substance use disorders. So one thing that we know about substance use disorders is that genetics account for 50 to 75 percent of substance use disorders. So that's a tremendous amount. So when we're looking at where did it come from, uh, one of the things that we need to really be aware of is that if there are substance use disorders in the family, in the background, uh, there is a, a greater chance of acquiring a substance use disorder. So biology and genetics, um, also gender has some influence. We're going to talk a little bit about co-occurring disorders, but also kind of the root of administration. So for instance, um, you know, snorting heroin, not quite as addictive as shooting heroin, although one usually leads onto the other. The effects of the drug, and also some things in the environment. So biology is a huge chunk of developing this, but also things in the environment like using early, as we said, how available it is in the neighborhood, in the peer group, uh, how costly it might be. One of the things that we know, even going to tobacco, is that the higher the price of the substance, the less um, teens are going to be able to acquire and use it. So cost is a factor. And then things also uh, that are uh, um, connected to trauma, like chaotic household, uh, parents use peer influences, things in the community, things in the school are also risk factors. So all of these things work together uh, to develop the substance use disorder. So when I was uh, coming into the field and being trained, uh, we did not have DSM-5, uh, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is put together by uh, the American Psychiatric Association. So we're talking about a bunch of um, esteemed doctors putting together diagnostic criteria and if you use DSM uh, at all, you may be aware that there are some real limitations to DSM. It's what these doctors come up with and agree upon as being the criteria for a specific disorder, and they change. And these have changed over time. Um, substances have been added, taken away, different criteria. Uh, so when I was trained, and I won't, I guess probably it was DSM, the two or three, um, we had substance abuse, and then we had substance dependence. And there was a clear cut set of criteria for abuse. And then if you reach certain other ones, you were considered dependent. That's not the case with substance use disorders in DSM-5. Uh, so we're gonna go through what the criteria are. There are 11 criteria for diagnosing a substance use disorder. And when we get to the end of this, we'll see, you know, how this rates you in terms of having a disorder. But keep in mind as we go through that it only takes two of these to begin to get a diagnosis for a mild substance use disorder and then uh, goes from mild to severe. So uh, two of these 11 is enough to start um, with, a, with a diagnosis. So the first one is impaired control. So they're divided into four different kind of subsets of symptom types. And the first one is impaired control. So the first one is using for longer periods of time than intended, or using larger amounts than in intended. So the person is really experiencing some loss of control. And uh, when we talk to people who are uh, exper have experienced these uh, disorders, this can be very, very troubling and can feel kind of uh, a sense of despair and pain and suffering, um, you know, feeling dishonest, some self-loathing, um, lacking purpose and control over life. So this is, these substance uh, use disorder criteria uh, 
this can be very uh, troubling to the person who's experiencing them. So that's the first one, using for longer periods of time than intended or using larger amounts than intended. Um, the second one is wanting to reduce use, but being unsuccessful in doing so. So this is not so much someone else, like your probation officer or your spouse demands that you use less, but the person themselves wants to reduce use and they find themselves uh, still not being able to reduce that amount of use, even though they have the desire. The third one is spending excessive time getting, using, and recovering from the drug use. So one thing that we know is not, it, it's just not the time that's lost using. Um, when I was running an outpatient clinic down in Monroe, New York, at that time, a lot of people were um, using crack cocaine, um, and also heroin, and they actually had to go all the way to the Bronx to get it. So there was a lot of time, the, the hours drive into the Bronx, to go to the crack house, to obtain the substance, to bring it home, to use it, and sometimes they ended up doing that more than once in one day. Now we find that most substances are readily available in the community, but there's still time that's spent in obtaining the substance uh, and then also in the using and in recovering. This varies from substance to substance as well, so that for some substances you can use, get high, and it will just be over uh, the course of a couple of hours, where with sub -sub substances and with binge using, you know, it may be uh, hours into to days, and recovering can also take uh, a couple of days after uh, binging on some substances. And the fourth criteria in the impaired control category is cravings that are so intense it's difficult to think about anything else. And this is very difficult to understand if you haven't had them. So I like to think about things that I crave, having been someone who's struggled with diet over, over years and you know that thought of, oh, I really want to have this, but I'm not supposed to. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. And those kind of cravings that are really much, much less intense. These cravings can be so um, intense that they become quite over, overwhelming and very difficult to resist. So that's the first category, impaired control. So we have four criteria that fall into that category. The second category is social impairment. So these have to do with uh, how our use affects our social life, our family life, our obligations. So the, the uh, fifth criteria is continued use despite problems with work, school, or family and social obligations. So sometimes this will be um, not being able to get up and go to work, even though we want to keep our job, um, skipping school, um, using despite um, you know um, social obligations we're supposed to be somewhere go somewhere it's thanksgiving dinner but we can't quite get up and go uh, and so that's one of them and then continued substance use despite having interpersonal problems is the sixth one so um, for instance problems in a uh, in a marriage problems in a relationship with parents and uh, one of the things that we know about people with substance use disorders is that sometimes it appears that uh, they may not uh, care or what we used to call not denial. When I worked in inpatient rehab, every other sentence was you're in denial, which is really not helpful to anybody for in any way. Um, and really it has to do with this ambivalence about um, using or not using and often gets verbalized as not caring but continuing to use um, you know most people don't want to have these problems in their interpersonal relationships but they continue to uh, use even though they are having these problems so for family members it may seem as if the person um, who is using the substance is choosing the substance over them. So for instance, if you loved me, you would stop. Um, you wouldn't do this anymore if you wanted to stay together, or if you wanted to be a good 
parent, you wouldn't do this. And really, it's not so much uh, of a choice between one or the other. We talked about those intense cravings, um, but also using despite these interpersonal problems that really are very troubling and problematic to the person, even if they're not able to verbalize that. And then number seven, important and meaningful social and recreational activities may be given up or reduced. So it might not seem like a lot to give up recreational activities, but it may be that someone was very involved in, in sports or in working out, but it also could be uh, social groups changing. A lot of times what we see with adolescents, one of the first signs of a problem may be that the peer group is changing, old friends aren't around anymore, um, and it may be a choice from uh, the person who's using or a friend who's not using to, uh, to not engage in that relationship anymore or to reduce the, the interaction. So giving up things that used to be uh, meaningful. The third category of criteria is risky use. And so it used to be that this would be more toward the dependence end of the category between abuse and dependence, but now we just have this um, kind of uh, spectrum continuum of, um, of symptoms. And in risky use, we have repeated use of substances in physically dangerous situations. So this could be driving a car, um, it could be, you know, walking in certain circumstances, um, heavy, heavy machinery, um, any, any place where you could be um, you know, experience some kind of a danger from that. Um, it's also could be physically dangerous if you're taking care of a child or do you know something else where your attention is is needed on what you're doing. Um, I have had um, clients in uh, in recovery who talk about um, working in kitchens and and chopping off the end of their fingertips and things like that. Um, that they know were related to their substance that never were related by other people at the time, but they knew it was because of the, the physically dangerous situation that they put themselves in through their use. And I just want to check my language there because I put this, I said they put themselves in that situation and we want to keep remembering about stigma and person-centered language and that a lot of these things that seem to be voluntary and a choice uh, generally are not when you're experiencing the substance use disorder. It doesn't seem like a choice. Uh, and number nine, continued use of substances, even though they are aware it's causing worsening physical and psychological problems. Uh, a lot of times this will be, um, you know, you've seen the doctor and they say you're beginning to have some liver damage or um, you see the dentist and uh, methamphetamine is damaging your teeth. Um, you're having some kind of physical uh, problems related to substance use, and even knowing that um, it's difficult to stop and the use is continued. And then there are two what are called pharmacological indicators, and these used to be the two that were markers of a physical addiction that would kind of kick you from abuse into dependence because. They, they're more physical manifestations. So the first one is tolerance. And tolerance refers to needing markedly increased amounts of the substance in order to in achieve intoxication of the desired effect. So it takes more of the substance um, to experience the effect. Or markedly diminished effect with continued use of the same amount. So you're using the same amount but not having, uh, not having the, the result of getting high. And this has to do uh, with tolerance. Now, there is another symptom that I'll just mention uh, that at the uh, far end of the spectrum in substance use disorders, when uh, people who have liver damage, um, mostly due to alcohol, are, are getting toward the end stages, they have something called reverse tolerance, which is you know, maybe they have um, just a drink or two and seem to be, um, you know, very inebriated, more so than they used to be when they would kind of drink everybody under the table, as they would say. 
uh, so reverse tolerance is kind of a sign that the liver is is failing because you're not able to process the alcohol. The second physical um, symptom is withdrawal. And withdrawal has um, two different ways that they can manifest too. The first one is development of characteristic withdrawal symptoms for the substance. So these are listed in the DSM. I'm not gonna go through all of different substances today because we're doing that in many of the other webinars, but it would be what's typical for that substance. So a withdrawal syndrome for alcohol would look different than withdrawal syndrome for, uh, for opiates, for example. Or uh, the same or a closely related substance is taken to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. So um, withdrawal can be, you know, that you go into the withdrawal sy syndrome. For a lot of people with substance use disorders, that's their greatest fear is going into that withdrawal. So when we see someone who's addicted to opiates and we can't imagine why they would continue to do that, uh, usually their biggest fear is really the sickness, the physical sickness that they feel uh, when they uh, go into withdrawal. So they may avoid that at all costs by relieving the, the symptoms uh, by taking another substance or taking the same substance again. So those are the 11 criteria for dependence. And then the way that this kind of plays out is that, uh, as I said, you need to meet at least two of the criteria to be diagnosed with a substance use disorder. And the severity of addiction is determined by the number of criteria met. So no disorder, zero to one. So you can have one of those things and you don't quite hit the criteria for a disorder. Mild disorder, two to three symptoms, moderate, four to five, and then severe, uh, six or more symptoms. So that's pretty much the way the 11 symptoms work with the new DSM-5. As I said, it's a little bit limited. There are some things that, um, that you know, are uh, still could be tweaked um, and will be tweaked. This is a, a book, when you look at the DSM, it's something that's constantly in, in flux and the next edition is being worked on. The DSM goes on to um, give us some categories for um, substance use disorders. So these are the substances that are in the DSM, um, alcohol, then cyclidine, which is PCP, inhalants, stimulants, which include amphetamine and cocaine, uh, cannabis, marijuana, or hash, other hallucinogens, which would be things like uh, LSD, um, opioids, opioids are morphine, heroin, codeine, painkillers, Sedative hypnotics and anxiolytics are things like benzodiazepines, Valium, uh, Clonopin, and also tobacco use disorders listed in the DSM-5. Uh, what's also looked at in the DSM-5, there, there's a provisional category. Caffeine is also being added. And um, also gambling is moving from a more of a mental health model into this kind of substance use fitting the same kind of a syndrome, although there are differences. Uh, so that's looked at also in the DSM. And we will be doing a um, webinar on gambling, I believe, in the month of July. In addition to these, this disorder, so a clinician you know, does the, the checklist um, and they determine how many you meet. Someone can self-diagnose pretty easily using this if, if they're uh, looking uh, at their own use. Uh, and then there are also specifiers. So we know someone has a substance use disorder, but not everybody is um, in the same um, you know, place in their use. And so there are some specifiers that can be added. So one is in early remission. So this is somebody who meets the criteria, but they're not currently using. In sustained remission, so somebody has been not using that category of drug for, us, uh, for a significant period of time. And one thing to note about this is that it's for each category. So you could have, say, opiate use disorder in sustained remission, but someone who is, uh, who is continuing to use 
another substance that meets the category for uh, for alcohol use disorder or can cannabis use disorder. So we have these specifiers. Another specifier is on maintenance therapy, and we're going to talk about what some of those medications that are used in conjunction with treatment uh, are for some of the categories, and that's often helpful to know if someone is on maintenance therapy. And another specifier is in a controlled environment. So if someone meets the criteria for being in remission because they haven't used, but they're in, a, in an environment where the substance is not available, say they're in, I don't know, there aren't too many places where you can't find substances, but say you're incarcerated or in a boarding school or in a, you know, I don't know, some isolated setting um, in a controlled environment, sometimes that's a specifier to say, well, we don't really know you know, would you be using if you were not in that controlled environment or not? Okay, we're going to look at different substances so that you get some kind of an idea of uh, the prevalence of substances uh, because we hear so much more about some than others and how dangerous they are. Uh, and so I think this is really important to look at the percentage, the percent of Americans with a substance use disorder by drug of choice. So we use this term drug of choice, and, and typically we kind of tend to look at the primary drug of choice. Some people will have a secondary drug of choice. So say alcohol is my primary drug of choice, but if I can't get that, um, I'll use cannabis or I use alcohol more, most, but I also use cannabis. So you can see that 64.5% uh, is alcohol. Alcohol remains a very big problem in terms of cost to the individual, the family, to children, to society. Uh, alcohol is a tremendous issue and uh, we tend to look differently at it because it, it is, you know, liquid and most of the other drugs are not. It's legal, most of the other drugs are not, although some are. Uh, but alcohol tends to have a greatest impact. And the second uh, drug um, with substance use disorder, the second in prevalence is marijuana. So 15% of people diagnosed with a substance use disorder, um, it is marijuana. We do, uh, we will be doing a webinar coming up very soon on marijuana and we'll talk more about this. Um, you know, it's, it's a subject of great, interest and debate, uh, but 15% of people entering inpatient treatment are going for a cannabis use disorder. Uh, so they do develop a significant problem with it, even though most people that use may not develop the disorder. And then after that, we have um, prescription uh, drugs, uh, opioids, painkillers mainly, um, and that tends to tie in with, uh, with the heroin use and other um, opioids, and then 4% cocaine and the other substances, you know, a percent or two here or there. So this is the prevalence. It's kind of interesting to look at and to make note of um, what we're talking about. We're going to look at um, some other rates of, of overdose and so forth, which will give us a little bit different picture than what this is giving us. So here's a chart that talks about substance use disorder rates uh, over the lifetime, um, within the last year and over the course of a lifetime. And I apologize for a little bit of fuzziness on this slide, but I thought it was important. Uh, alcohol abuse, without being dependent on it, we think that about one in 10 people over the course of a lifetime will develop alcohol abuse without dependence, and about two and a half um, in over the course of the last year. Alcohol dependence, so then we're talking about tolerance, withdrawal, some kind of a physical dependency, 15% over the course of a lifetime, and 7% during the last year. So we're talking about a fairly large population. And then if we look at illicit drugs, you can see the rates there over the course of a lifetime, 4.4% without dependence, 7.5% uh, 
uh, with physical dependence over, over the lifetime. So uh, any substance abuse or dependence over the course of the last year, 11% of the population, and over the course of the lifetime, 26.6%, so one in four developing any substance abuse or dependence over the course of a lifetime. So that's that means that we all know somebody, right, or have had somebody in our life, at least one person who meets this criteria. We want to talk about co-occurring disorders. One of the things that's really important to note about substance use disorders is that they do not occur typically in isolation. Usually they are related to, um, they're co-occurring with some other disorders and also with trauma. So if we look at co-occurring disorders, 50% uh, of people with a severe mental disorder also have substance problems. 53% uh, of individuals abusing drugs have at least one diagnosed mental illness, and 37% of people abusing alcohol um, have at least one mental illness. So a little bit of difference between drugs and alcohol, but the rates are still very high. And uh, then again, we see that rate of 40 to 60% who um, are vulnerable due to genetics and the environment. So another way of looking at this is if we kind of look at uh, this little Venn diagram of how things overlay. I want to, the last slide looked at uh, substance use disorders and uh, mental health issues. This one also adds in trauma, which I like. Trauma is so important to understanding uh, all of these, the interplay of all of these different things together. So with, under the substance use category, we have the chemical and behavioral aspects of it, but we have this shared um, relationship between addiction and trauma, which includes abuse, neglect, uh, loss and grief issues, PTSD. And then there's a shared relationship between trauma and uh, psychiatric disorders, including mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, personality disorders, really all of them. Uh, so the shared relationship between trauma and psychiatric illness, and then in the middle, the patient at, at, who is the most sy symptomatic with all three areas activated. So when we look at our ACEs training and trauma training, this becomes very important to understanding uh, the a person who's experiencing these problems and the complexity that they may bring to uh, to the picture when we're addressing these issues because we're usually dealing with uh, a lot of different factors coming into play. So when I began in this field, oh, so many decades ago, uh, we did not really understand about the stages of change, which has become one of the main models in looking at um, how we help people to overcome substance use disorders. Um, as I said, we used to just say they were, they were in denial, we needed to break their denial, get them to go to a 12-step program and um, you know, uh, commit to never using that substance again. Well, the stages of change are really helpful in looking at substance use disorders um, and they give us kind of a template for uh, different treatment and uh, recovery modalities. So if we look at the um, upper left pre-contemplation, and um, I like that they use food here because I can relate to that. So pre-contemplation means I'm not really even thinking about uh, stopping the behavior. So here we have a nice, you know, I like to imagine it's a bacon cheeseburger or something. And I love it and I don't care if it kills me, I'm not going to change my behavior. And um, so we know when people are in this, in this stage of change, um, what we wanna do is kind of move them along into contemplation. What we've done typically, what the field of substance use disorder treatment has done is brought people in pre-contemplation, 
and said, uh, not only do you, you know, you're in denial and you need to change, but you are going to change. You're going to stop today. We're going to take your analysis to keep track of you. And we're going to send you to these meetings and you need to sign this slip. And that's how you're going to get better. And that worked for some people amazingly. Uh, but but for most, that's not really the best way to go about it. So we talk about kind of looking at pre-contemplation into contemplation and being person-centered. It's kind of, is this what the person really wants for themselves? So contemplation might be, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about maybe I could stop my eating habits and get healthy. I don't really know if I want to exercise it might be hard i'm not sure how i would do it what do i need to do but i'm thinking about making the change and then we move into preparation which would be thinking about how i'm going to do it am i going to start an exercise program maybe what kind of diet am i going to ad adopt and the same thing is true we're going to look at treatment modalities and pathways to recovery and there are many many different ones now that we're going to, to look at this very exciting change in the field. So I've had to look at kind of how do I want to do it? What will work for me? You know, what do, what do I think is going to happen? Let me kind of prepare. And then we move into action. I get going. I try out my plan. I see how it works. And, um, you know, during that action time, this is a time when perhaps a, a recurrence of the old behavior will will happen so there might be a return to using for a time it may be a brief period of time it may be a longer period of time but generally we kind of you know um don't don't always move in a linear fashion toward what's good for us all the time we tend to have kind of uh, a little back and forth going on before we reach uh, what we would call maintenance which is maintaining that behavior and then again, we see that relapse, relapse can, can come in. And language is really important. And some people don't like the use of the, the word relapse at all. They prefer recurrence or uh, return to use as um, a, a more positive term. But so looking at the stages of changes is one way of really looking at how do we work with people and meet them where they are um, in in getting uh, toward recovery. So reducing uh, stigma is huge in the substance use disorder field. Uh, Friends of Recovery is um, uh, growing. Um, there's a Friends of Recovery New York. There's Friends of Recovery Duchess and Ulster. Uh, looking at how do we do reduce the uh, incidences of substance use disorders, but also looking at the fact that it can happen to anyone, to any family, at any time. It doesn't have anything to do with um, your moral character, your shortcomings, your, um, you know, your upbringing, your, your socioeconomic status. So just knowing that substance use disorders can happen at any time. And uh, we know from just the history of 12-step programs, one of the reasons that they're called Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous is that people were really afraid of making it known that they had a problem, even if they were no longer uh, drinking or using. There's a lot of stigma attached to having had a problem. And so uh, the programs were anonymous. They only used first names. And that tradition has kind of continued because we still do have this stigma that, that attaches. So language is very important. And uh, I know that um, we've been doing a lot of work around language when it comes to LGBTQ plus community, uh, when it comes to kind of gender and pronouns, and um, when we're looking at race and ethnicity, we're looking at language. So this is another area where language may be changing, and it may be a little bit harder for those of us who've been around longer, or are used to certain terms, to look at changes in language. I know it's very difficult for me to uh, to adapt to using they pronouns, but I make that commitment to 
my friends who use those pronouns to get it right. And so it's important to also get it right when it comes to stigmatizing language with substance use disorders. So instead of talking about an addict or an abuser, we talk about the person having a substance use disorder. Well, uh, some people do not object to the word addiction or addicted to, but the term, um, you know, fill in the blank, cocaine use disorder uh, is preferred. Instead of saying that someone is clean or dirty, and we used to talk to the, a lot about this with especially your analysis, but instead of saying someone is clean, <coughs> excuse me, they're substance free, instead of saying they're dirty, they're, they're actively using, they're still using substances. So instead of a clean or dirty test result, negative or positive result for this substance, um, someone who is positive for uh, cannabis, not they're, they're dirty. And um, instead of saying someone is a reformed addict, a uh, person in recovery is a preferred term. Um, and you know there are some others, as I talked about, um, the term denial. Now we talk more about ambivalence than about denial. Um, instead of saying that someone is untreated, they're not yet in recovery. Um, one of the sayings that used to be really popular is a drug is a drug is a drug. Uh, the alternative term terminology now is to focus on the drug that the client feels is creating the problem and each substance has unique interactions with the brain. Uh, some of them, uh, there are medications that are helpful and some there are not. Instead of self-help group, the term mutual aid group is used more. Uh, so there are other, other changes also in, in language and this is important. And as, you know, when we're talking about um, uh, other populations that may prefer certain terms to be used, it's important to ask people what, how they want to be referred to and not assume or guess or make it up. We can always ask them what they think. So treatment modalities. So these are the different modes of treatment that tend to be um, uh, paid for through insurance or Medicaid that are uh, so-called professional treatments. And so there are different, there are a range of treatments um, and these are the levels of treatment. So the first one being detox. So detox is usually a fairly short stay of, of a couple of days uh, to get over those physical withdrawal symptoms. For some substances, including alcohol and benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax and Klonopin, the detox can be much longer. It can take a longer time to taper. And also you can die from withdrawal to alcohol and benzodiazepines. You won't die from a detox from opiates. It will feel like it. Um, and the person may, may feel like they wish that they would, but uh, generally not, it, it's not a fatal incident, but you can die of withdrawal. So it is very important if someone is in withdrawal from benzodiazepines or alcohol to get them professional help. Um, an inpatient treatment is generally anywhere from seven, 14, 21 days um, right now in New York, insurance must cover 14 days of inpatient treatment. Once uh, the person is certified, uh, you get at least those two weeks. And then generally they have to uh, kind of beg for more, more days in inpatient treatment. So it's a very short term. It used to be when I worked in inpatient, we had at least several weeks in the case of adolescents, seven weeks to work with them. And now it's a much quicker process where discharge planning has to begin at admission because they're gonna be out so soon. Outpatient treatment generally is anywhere, anything from um, an individual once a week to three to five visits. There is extended outpatient, which could be going say, you know, nine o'clock to one o'clock Monday through Friday um, and having several groups and an individual and maybe a mutual aid group. Um, Generally, individual therapy with, with a therapist is not the recommended modality for substance use treatment, just because the, um, the peer group is very, very helpful. However, there are some cases, such as when people have severe so social phobias, uh, where it's very difficult for them to engage in a group process. 
uh, short and long-term residential treatment. So now you're going to live there. You're going to stay longer than just a, a couple of weeks. And um, generally, they tend to um, be up to a year or so in residential treatment. A therapeutic community is really kind of old school. They've been around for a long time. But where they're, uh, the theory used to be that they would kind of break you down to build you up again. That's not necessarily the way they go now. But therapeutic communities are generally um, run by people who have been through the community themselves. And generally, they're at least a year, um, maybe 18 months or longer. A halfway house is a setting where you would go after an inpatient treatment um, and you would live there and have house meetings and maybe mutual aid or some other kind of support, but also be able to, uh, to work or do some other activity. So the living, we don't tend to have as much of as in New York State, but very popular in uh, many other states, which is just a kind of a sober house where you would be able to live and people are um, trying to maintain abstinence and live together, but generally are working or, or engaged in other activities. And then medication assistant treatment, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth in a couple of minutes. So I put a focus just specifically, we're going to uh, talk more about opiates. We're gonna do a whole webinar on opiates, but I wanna just hit these really um, fast because it's so important to get this particular information about what's going on with opiates right now. I just wanted to put up this this quick list of known opiate users and abusers. This is several years old, so there's much much more than we could uh, that we could add at this time. But just the prevalence of people who've had opiate use disorders, and they tend to have the most stigma attached, and yet they're very very common. Um, we're very concerned about overdoses from these uh, opiates. As you can see, the yellow line that points straight up is overdoses due to synthetic narcotics like uh, mainly fentanyl and carfentanyl. And then you'll see prescription opioids and also heroin being the top of for the most part, other rates of um, overdose have gone up very slowly, but these have really just become a national tragedy. And so we want to be really aware of how common these are. And in a way, it's unfair. We used to kind of uh, opioid overdoses used to be something that happened in very poor areas and were not, uh, you know, people from all walks of life, and now they are. And so it gets much more attention and different kind of modes of treatment, and I guess that's a, a good thing and a bad thing altogether. But I wanna just talk for a minute about medication-assisted treatment. Um, it's very important to understand and to accept that some people are assisted greatly by medication when they have opioid use disorders. Um, and there are three different medications, basically, that are really used um, and are helpful in this. Methadone is the first one. And methadone really has had a bad rap over the years as the person is still using, they're still high, it's just another drug. Methadone is a full agonist, which means it kind of does generate that effect. But the majority of people on methadone maintenance function really well, and it means that they are not using street drugs, they're uh, able to maintain their life and uh, you know you wouldn't you wouldn't really be able to uh, know who's on methadone and who's not for the most part in the general population. The second one, buprenorphine is a partial agonist and it can be helpful and um, and then the third one is naltrexone. And naltrexone uh, Blocks the, blocks the effect. So these are three different kinds of medication-assisted treatment that are very important. There are more and more doctors that are prescribing them. Uh, they're also helpful uh, for people who are, um, say, leaving jail. Leaving jail, um, people with opioid use disorders who leave jail have a very high risk of overdose when they relapse because they generally think they need the same amount of the drug as when they went into jail. And now that they've withdrawn, uh, 
that's not the case and it's really easy to overdose. So that's one um, one initiative, um, helping people who are leaving incarceration to start on medication before they, uh, before they leave can be very helpful. So um, one really important piece of reducing stigma is reducing the stigma related to these medication assisted treatments and recognizing that they can be very, very helpful to people in recovery. The other important piece that I want to note, and again, we have many, many webinars uh, that um, Ulster Prevention Council is doing around Narcan training. Narcan simply reverses an opiate overdose. Uh, it blocks the brain cell receptors uh, activated by opioids, and it can restore breathing within a couple of minutes. It can't be abused, you don't get high. If you're not in an opioid overdose, it's not going to hurt you. And I would just encourage everybody to please do this training and get the Narcan. We'll actually deliver it to your home if you don't have it and you participate in the training. And um, recently, um, Samadhi Institute in, in uh, Kingston has been actually going into the places where overdoses are occurring uh, residences where a lot of people are using and so forth and have actually had several saves just over the last few weeks. During the, the um, COVID pandemic, opioid overdoses have really shot up, unfortunately. There's a, a real increase in that community. I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes about multiple pathways to recovery. And this is really important. Uh, we used to have just, you know, one or two ways that people recovered. Either they went to a uh, professional treatment um, and generally in conjunction with going to a self-help 12-step program. Now there are what are called multiple pathways to recovery. We recognize that not everyone gets help in the same way and so there are many, many uh, different ways that people are able to get help. In a study of people who were in solid recovery, most of them said that they used more than one, that they used three or four of these, that there were many, many things that were helpful to them. So natural recovery would be just kind of the decision, I'm going to stop using, I'm, and someone just continues to use uh, without going to some sort of a formal group or a program. Uh, generally, they say that they had a lot of help from family and friends and a lot of support. The self-help uh, mutual aid groups um, include things like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, we're familiar with them. Um, you know, people tend to either love them or not love them. Uh, they are spiritual programs that talk about a higher power. So that can be a barrier for some people, but very helpful for others. And there are non-12-step uh, mutual aid groups, and we'll look at a couple of those. There are also some faith-based recovery groups. Uh, there are some cultural recovery groups. Uh, some people get um, get uh, into recovery through uh, the criminal justice system, whether it's a drug court or through being on probation and being monitored. Um, and then some people uh, look at body work like yoga. We have trauma-informed yoga, uh, meditation that sort of thing, and then other, other therapies and giving back or other things that people mentioned. And so here are just a few of the programs that are available out there um, so that you get kind of an idea of how many there are. So in addition to the ones that we know about, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, uh, there's uh, Women for Sobriety, which has um, kind of a four-point process to um, getting clean. And see, I said getting clean instead of in recovery. I used the wrong language. Um, and Women for Sobriety uses affirmations that promote emotional and spiritual awareness uh, tailored to women. We have um, Smart Recovery. Smart Recovery is a four-point program that really talks about motivation, coping with urges, problem solving, and lifestyle um, balance. Rational Recovery is another one that um, 
is a secular program, Life Ring is secular. White Bison Native American uh, recovery is a, a system that um, really is um, interesting in that there are certain um, rituals in Native cultures that you're not allowed to participate in if you're using a substance. And so that can be a big motivator to um, participating in cultural activities. Um, Chinese medicine work is another pathway uh, that's cultural. Um, Calix Society is a, is a Catholic um, treatment program and it really talks about kind of putting down the wrong cup and picking up the cup of, of communion and so forth. Um, Celebrate Recovery is another Christian-based, Christ-centered program. Talked a little bit about spirit and body work, meditation, uh, medication-assisted treatment. And I just wanted to mention when we do the webinar on uh, adolescents, I'll talk more about the seven challenges. Seven challenges is an adolescent-specific program that really begins in that stages of change model with moving a youth from that pre-contemplation into contemplation. Uh, and so that they can start to think about beginning to uh, enter recovery. And lastly, I just want to mention the peer support movement. This is a huge new movement in recovery. Um, and in New York, they've developed a certification, certified recovery uh, peer advocate. And uh, this involves peers working with uh, those who are entering recovery and helping them to navigate the system, find resources, get support, know about all the different pathways toward recovery, and uh, just to kind of be um, that the person that's there to support them. Um, one initiative that's just starting now in Ulster County is for people who have overdosed on opioids, they are now uh, going to be followed by peers uh, to follow up after an overdose and see are they getting the support and the help that they need uh, in order to uh, enter recovery. And this peer support movement also emphasizes uh, that person-centered approach of what does the person want to accomplish and how do they want to go about that. So that's it for today in substance use disorders. I'll stick around for a minute if anybody wants to chat. And uh, we'll see you again on Wednesday for our next topic in the educational expedition.